Hi, my name is Michael Nilsson and I'm a principal engineer at Autodesk. Welcome to this behind the effects video which covers the Bifrost combustion solver parameters. So in particular we'll be taking a look at each of the parameters exposed, uh, take a look at what it means and how it maps to the underlying physics in the combustion solver. And if you're more interested in all the technology and physics behind the solver, I highly recommend you have a look at the fundamentals of combustion in Bifrost uh, video, which is also part of the Behind the Effects series. So to give you an overview of the parameters, I'm just taking outset in the basic combustion compound, which you can create in the Bifrost graph editor by choosing simulation aero basic combustion graph then I exploded the graph and connected it up to an input sphere as the source geometry and connected aero volume to the output and uh, placed a watch point here on the output connection and uh, this is the general setup for a basic combustion graph of course you can add all kinds of other nodes to control the parameters and uh, etc. But compared to a basic aero graph, there are two new nodes here. So there's the source fuel node and the combustion settings. And these are the two nodes that we will cover uh, in this particular video. So before I go into detail with the parameters themselves, I just want to point out what you can see here on the watch point on the output connection. So here you can see all the, the properties that are part of the output object and specifically those that relate to combustion are listed here. So I'll go through them. So we have the voxel, voxel property called expansion rate. So basically this models how much the volume expands or contracts at, a, at uh, each voxel in space. The combustion solver will compute this property under the hood, but you can also manually hijack the, the property and inject your own values into this. Then there's the voxel flame level set property, which is the level set that tracks the actual flame propagation. So if you watch the be behind the effects video called uh, Combustion Fundamentals in Bifrost, uh, you might remember that I talked about the thin flame model and uh, this level set actually models where this thin flame is and the channel or property here called flame speed then at each point in space determines what is the speed in the normal direction of this flame level set which represents the thin flame. Then we have the voxel fog density which is also part of the aero simulations now when we talk about combustion simulations, the fog density is actually the soot. So if you enable soot generation as part of the combustion simulation, the soot will be emitted into the fog density channel. Then depending on which type of fuel you use, you'll have different types of fuel properties. Here we're using methane. I'll come back to that uh, in a second, how you can use other types of fuel, but that will be represented by its own property called in this case voxel fuel methane. Now as the combustion process begins and fuel and oxidizers turned into products we also model explicitly the, the products in our case to compute things like radiation and we have carbon dioxide which is represented by this property we have nitrogen which is part of the oxidizer and we have oxygen which is also part of the oxidizer. Now voxel gas vapor is a, one of the products of the combustion process and as I'll also come back to later you can condense the water vapor and render it out. We also have a special property for the ignition temperature and that's because the, t the ignition temperature can vary per source so you can have different sources with different ignition temperatures so it can vary throughout space and therefore is represented by this property. We have the temperature which is also part of aero simulations but in the case of combustion it's more an active part of the simulation as the combustion process is going on it will 
uh, generate heat which feeds into the, the temperature channel. And apart from that we have a few other properties that are also part of error simulations, velocities, the tile tree represents the, the spatial variation or the, the spatial variation of voxel resolution and we also have the acceleration up here which is part of the improved time integration that Robert covers in another, another series. Now there's one additional property that you can add to the list of properties uh, here. If you select combustion settings and choose store blue flame you'll see another property pop up here called voxel combustion rate and the voxel combustion rate models the rate of combustion at each point in space that is how much fuel uh, reacted with oxidizer at that particular point and that is what we use to render out as the blue flame. Now you may have noticed that we also have the option to turn store water vapor on here it's off by default but we do actually always compute the, the vapor as a product of the combustion process so the the property is here but if you do enable store water vapor we'll make sure to track the water vapor properly throughout space even though there's no other property of significance there for example soot but if you're not really interested in visualizing the vapor then you can leave this off if you want to visualize the vapor with our condensation model, which I'll describe a bit later on, then you need to turn store water vapor on. Okay, so now let's have a look at some of the parameters on the fuel node. So we have the general parameters here, which enable the fuel source. You can set the start frame, where you start emission from this fuel source. If you want to end the emission at a certain frame you said use end frame on and then you can enter your particular choice of end frame here so the more interesting parameters related to combustion are listed down here so the first one is the fuel type which by default is methane but from this drop down menu you can choose other types of fuels and I'd like to point out that this again ties back into the ultimate goal that we have in the Bifrost Combustion Solver where we'd like to provide physically plausible results by default. Again, I want to emphasize that we are not there yet, but this is what we're striving for. So if you want to match some real-world footage, you could choose the type of fuel that was used to generate the real-world footage if you happen to know it. So if you're not really interested in what type of fuel you're using but you're just trying to create some type of effect then I just recommend to start from the default which is a methane and then you can work your way towards your desired goal or effect by tweaking some of the parameters. Now the next parameter is the ignition temperature and basically the ignition temperature specifies at which temperature a voxel will ignite if the mixture of species in that voxel is flammable and it's specified in degrees celsius and you can set it per source to any number that you wish that's convenient for your particular setup it doesn't have to be physically based in any way we since we use the thin flame model this number does not tie into the reaction rate so it won't either slow reactions down or speed them up because with the thin flame model as the thin flame passes a voxel it will either completely burn or if it's not passed by the flame it will not burn. One thing to keep in mind then is that if you want a flame that starts propagating from some point in space then you just need to set a group of voxels at that point to a temperature that's above the ignition temperature and if you want the flame to propagate into a mixture of fuel and oxidizer that is flammable it's important to keep in mind that this mixture cannot be preheated to be above the ignition temperature because then it will ignite instantly so if you're setting up a simulation like a Bunsen burner type of simulation for example 
then the premixed fuel and oxidizer will just enter at room temperature and then around the flame we have a high temperature above the ignition temperature that will then make the thin flame propagate into the fuel uh, to get the correct flame look. So the next parameter is the oxygen percentage and the source fuel node allows you to specify some mixture of fuel and oxidizer and the oxygen percentage describes obviously the percentage of the oxidizer that's oxygen and so if it's one the oxidizer will be pu pure oxygen if it's zero the oxidizer will be pure nitrogen so if it is pure nitrogen um, the mixture won't be flammable obviously oxygen is the thing that feeds into the combustion reaction and uh, reacts with the fuel so the closer to one that the oxygen percentage is the higher it is will affect the simulation in various ways so typically flames will propagate at higher speed the more ox oxygen you have in your oxidizer under certain conditions and it will also affect like uh, how much heat is generated and as an as a result of that how violent your explosions will be now it also depends on the amount of fuel that we have Obviously, if you are emitting pure oxygen but no fuel, then flames won't be able to propagate at faster speeds. But if your mixture is, for example, close to the stoichiometric conditions where all fuel and oxidizer will react, then if the oxidizer is pure oxygen, then flames will propagate faster than if it is just air. So one thing to note is that all the ambient air around your simulation is by default set up to be you know, consisting of around 20% oxygen and 80% nitrogen like the air in the real world. The final parameter is the burn rate and the burn rate is related to a parameter that you might be familiar with from the combustion literature called the equivalence ratio and basically the burn rate or the equivalence ratio lets you specify the relative amount of fuel and oxidizer in the mixture and in turn let you specify certain properties of the flame. So if the burn rate is set to zero it means that only fuel is emitted and in order for it to burn you need to turn on explicit oxygen diffusion in order for oxygen to diffuse into the fuel and then uh, be able to ignite. If the burn rate is set to 1, it means that the mixture that you are emitting with the source fuel node will be at perfect stoichiometric conditions. So if you ignite the, that mixture that's at perfect stoichiometric conditions, all fuel and oxidizer will react to turn into products and there will be no excess fuel or excess air. So if the burn rate is between 0 and 1, you'll be in what's called the fuel-rich regime, where each voxel that you are emitting into with this source fuel node will contain more fuel than can actually burn by the oxygen that's also present there. So there, after the combustion reaction, there'll be some excess fuel. If the burn rate is above 1, the maximum number you can set it to is 2. So if it's set to 2 you'll emit just oxidizer and in between 1 and 2 you'll be in what's called the fuel lean regime where after combustion has completed in that particular voxel there'll be an excess amount of uh, oxygen. Now all this affects how flames look and uh, we'll look at some videos in a second that illustrate this. So to illustrate the burn rate let's have a look at a simple setup in Maya that can be used to simulate flames either diffusion flames or, or premixed flames. So before I, I describe the setup in detail I just want to point out that one way to think about the burn rate visually is that as you go from a value of zero which is a diffusion flame the flame will be very sooty 
And as you move towards one or even two, a value of two uh, of the burn rate, you will gradually transition from a sooty flame to a cleaner blue flame. And uh, we'll illustrate this in, in, in these videos. So if we take a look at this particular setup, we have basically just two cylinder emitters. One cylinder in the middle here emits the fuel at room temperature and gives it an initial velocity upwards. Then around it and slightly overlapping with it, we have a hollow cylinder that emits hot air just above the ignition temperature. And this will make the thin flame or the, the fuel out here ignite and then the thin flame will propagate inwards and give you a simulated flame. If we look at how this is specified in the Bifrost graph itself, we have the fuel coming in. We first have a source air node that needs to be connected to the source fuel node. And the source air doesn't do much. It just gives it the initial speed. In this case, there's no temperature or fog density added. Then in the source fuel node, we emit a mixture of methane and air. We use uh, ignition temperature of 580 degrees Celsius and then an oxygen percentage of one. The burn rate is the parameter that we're going to vary in this experiment. Now the hot air geometry comes in with an input node, feeds into the source air, which I've called source hot air. And here we just set the temperature to uh, 600 degrees Celsius, which is above the ignition temperature. And then we set the same initial speed upwards for the hot air. So here's an example simulated using the setup I just described, fairly low resolution, where I've set the burn rate equal to one. So with a burn rate equal to one, we have perfect stoichiometric conditions, which means that we'll get a clean blue flame. So even though the soot formation model, the physics-based soot formation model was turned on, no uh, soot is actually generated in this particular case. So to uh, vary the, the volume of the flame, one thing you can do is to adjust the inflow velocity, and that's what I've done here. We have scaled the inflow velocity by one half of what I had previously. And as you can see, as a result, resulting blue flame is smaller, has a smaller volume. But apart from that, all the, the settings are the same. So here's an example using the same setup, same resolution, but where I've set the burn rate to 0 0.2. So we are now in the fuel rich regime, where after combustion has completed, there'll be excess fuel. And because we'll have incomplete combustion, there'll be some generation of soot, which in this particular case was generated using the physics-based soot formation model that we've implemented in Bifrost. And we've rendered out both uh, the blue flame and the soot, which particularly near the base of the flame, as you can see, gives rise to these uh, color nuances. So if we have a look at the same simulation again with a burn rate of 0 0.2, but just rendering out the blue flame, you can observe this particular blue flame pattern down here, where we have the interior blue flame, but then because not all fuel can immediately react, we have excess fuel, some of the fuel will escape upwards and create this secondary uh, flame out here. And this particular flame pattern is something that you can actually observe in the real world if you have a look at Bunsen burner experiments, for example. So one additional thing I'd just like to highlight with, with respect to the source fuel node is that you can actually daisy chain several source fuel nodes together to mix, to create a mixture of several types of fuels and, and potentially oxidizers. So if you create another source fuel node, can call this one source methane, this one let's say we want propane, then we can choose propane here and we can pipe 
the source fuel, the first source methane into the source propane node, and then we just delete this connection and feed it into, uh, then feed the, the daisy chain into the, the sources instead. And then we will emit both methane and propane. And as you can see, the system reacts, and now there's a voxel fuel propane as well. So let's now have a look at the parameters that I exposed on the combustion settings here. I'll start by describing the parameters that I exposed under the general tab. So enable combustion enables the combustion solver under the hood and if you turn it off it will just default to an error simulation so no combustion will be taking place. Combustion smoothness is a parameter that you can use to avoid voxel artifacts in propagating flame front or in the soot that's generated as part of the physics-based soot formation model as well as the soot that's oxidized away with this with the soot oxidation model and it will also smooth the combustion reaction rate property which you can use to render as the blue flame so it's important to note that the combustion smoothness will uh, not continuously feed back into the simulation. It only happens once, so if you introduce some soot it will be slightly smoothed once, but then it will evolve freely and can of course develop very high frequency detail after that. The store blue flame and store water vapor parameters I've already briefly discussed, but I'll just recap very briefly here. So the store blue flame you'll need to turn on if you want to output the voxel combustion rate channel that you can render as the blue flame. If you don't enable this it won't be output. So store water vapor you need to enable if you want to render the condensed water vapor. So we do compute the water vapor internally always but it may not be tracked reliably away from the flames, away from the soot. But if you want to do this you need to enable this, this option. So I'll briefly show you how you can use the condensed water vapor node in conjunction with the store water vapor option. So if you turn this on and then we need to, to insert condensed water vapor node. You can find it here. Then the condensed water vapor you can do it basically as a post process to the simulation. So if you've cast out as VDBs you can do it when you load in the VDBs and render them or you can do it before you save out or you can do it live here as a post-process to simulate error see the result directly in the viewport so basically you connect the error volume and then there are two options on the node the min temperature and the max temperature and basically the min temperature is the temperature below which all the water vapor will condense. So all the water vapor that's in a voxel that's below this, the min temperature will condense into something that you can actually see and render. Uh, and the maximum temperature above that, no water vapor condenses. And in between, we have a smooth transition. So the physical limits would be something like this, 0 to 100 it's specified in degrees Celsius but uh, in the video I'll show you in a moment I tweak these parameters for artistic effect. Here's an example that demonstrates the combustion smoothness and the effect that it has on the blue flame. So in particular this video alternates between a simulation that has a combustion smoothness of 0 and one that has a combustion smoothness of 1. And as you can see in the problematic simulation that has a combustion smoothness of 0 you have these obvious voxel artifacts and they arise due to the thin flame model that completely burns voxels and this creates these discontinuities but by enabling the combustion smoothness you can smooth these out uh, in a way that it doesn't continuously feed back into the simulation. So here's an example demonstrating the condensed water vapor node. So um, obviously uh, the combustion process will generate as part of its products uh, water vapor so essentially 
you'll have uh, water vapor everywhere. Uh, so if you just render it without condensing it, it will just obscure everything, basically. But if you insert the condensed water vapor node, as I demonstrated, then uh, you can use that to control where it actually condenses based on the temperature. And that's what you're seeing here. So as the air gradually cools down, the water vapor condenses and becomes visible. So in this particular simulation, I did tweak the min and max temperature slightly to get uh, the artistic effect of the water vapor condensing just above the flames. So I had to, to adjust the, the temperature settings for that. Now let's have a look at some of the thermodynamic properties that are supported by the combustion solver and bifrost. So before I describe the actual parameters in detail, let's have a look at the three fundamental mechanisms of heat transfer. So the first fundamental mechanism of heat transfer that I'll describe is convection. And convection is basically just advection or transport of the temperature field in the velocity field of the simulation. And in this particular buoyant simulation, you can clearly see the temperature moving upwards along with the uh, soot due to the, the buoyancy. Now, you'll also see that even though I don't have other types of heat transfer mechanisms turned on in this particular simulation, you will still see that the flow cools down a bit as it rises. And this is due to the turbulent mixing and the diffusion that's built into the numerical schemes we use to solve the transport equations. The second type of heat transfer mechanism is called conduction. And conduction is basically a diffusion process between two materials of different temperature that are in contact. So if the two materials are in contact, the temperature will diffuse or even out between the two. And in this particular video, I'm showing a simulation on the right where I've added just a tiny bit of temperature diffusion to the simulation on the left. So when I say tiny bit, in terms of parameter and bifrost, it's 0 0.003. And if you look at the simulation on the right, you'll notice that particularly at the start of the simulation and near the base of the simulation, the, the flow is calmer and, and the temperature distribution is smoother. Now, it does rise faster in this particular case because it has less turbulent motion uh, near the base, so the, the buoyant motion takes over. So the third type of heat transfer mechanism is called heat transfer by radiation. And contrary to conduction, which requires materials to be in contact in order for the heat to transfer between the two, radiation can transfer through space from one material to another without heating up the medium in between. And here we're seeing an example of this to simulate ignition at a distance where we have a flame in the middle that we ignite and then we have fuel seated in a torus close by but not in direct contact with the flame but due to the radiation the fuel in the torus heats up and ignites. So let's look at a, another uh, example. So basically radiation if you've watched the fundamentals or, of combustion uh, behind the effects video then you might recall that the radiation can be split, the radiation equations can be split into two parts. One part that deals with cooling and one part that deal with the, the heating up due to the incident radiation from all of the surroundings. And that's why we've exposed radiation as two different parameters in Bifrost. One parameter that allows you to control cooling and one parameter that allows you control to control the heating. Now, in this particular video, we're looking at the effect of radiative cooling. So, on the left, we have a simulation with radiative cooling set to zero, and on the right, we have a simulation where the radiative cooling is set to 0 0.2. And as you'll notice, in the simulation that has zero cooling, the flames reach higher into the plume. There's still some cooling due to the turbulent mixing with the cool air as I've described earlier and the diffusion in the miracle schemes but overall the simulation on the right has more cooling than the one on the, the left. Now let's have a look 
at the effect of radiative heating. So actually in graphics, the contribution from radiative heating is typically ignored under the implicit assumption that the radiation will just radiate off to infinity and not affect anything else. But as you can hopefully see from this comparison of one simulation which has radiative heating set to zero and one which has radiative heating set to one, that the radiation does in fact have a visual impact on the flow. And in particular, the simulation which has radiative heating on appears a lot warmer and lively. So let's have a look at how we've exposed controls for these thermodynamic processes. So under thermodynamic properties on the combustion settings node, we have exposed separate controls for radiative heating and radiative cooling. One thing to note is that very high values or values above one essentially of radiative heating can lead to quite dramatic uh, heating effects. So one should be a bit careful about setting this to a very high value. Now cooling if affects the cooling obviously. Higher values give rise to more cooling. Temperature diffusion is uh, exposed here. By default it's off. You can set it to any number you'd like but generally fairly low values are required in order to actually have quite a significant in impact on the flow. So these were conduction and radiation. Controls for convection or transport are actually represented on the aero solver settings and described in another behind the effects uh, video but I just want to point out that you can control the style here which gives you different types of spatial interpolators and different uh, qualities of the transport, transported properties. Now on the combustion settings under thermodynamic properties we also have a few other controls exposed. One is the uh, expansion scale and if you watch the behind the effects video about the fundamentals of combustion in Bifrost I derived an expression for how we compute the volume expansion and basically this is a scale applied to that expression. So if you set it to zero, there'll be no volume expansion as a result of the flow heating up and you can set higher values to, to get more volume expansion and values above one will give you volume expansion that's more than would happen in the, the real world. Now again you have to be a bit careful here because very high values on the expansion scale can make the flow expand very rapidly and lead to a high number of substeps. So if you are not satisfied with the magnitude of the explosion that you're achieving with the default values, you can try to increase it gradually. But we don't recommend setting it to a very high value immediately as this might slow the solve down quite a bit. One another thing to note about the expansion scale is that at very l low scale, small scales, for example, when you simulate a candle flame or a torch, we found that in practice you typically need to set the expansion scale to a number less than one to achieve results that are physically plausible and it's probably a combination of uh, the model being inaccurate and the fact that we're taking very large time steps which have a larger effect at small scales but setting it in practice to a, a, a lower value has uh, some value in that case. Now the flame propagation speed controls or is a multiplier on the flame propagation speed that's computed by the solver under the hood so as I also explained in the, the fundamentals of combustion video we compute the flame propagation speeds based on the species, concentration of species that are uh, spatially varying in the, in the grid. And this allows you to multiply that speed to achieve either slower speeds or faster speeds depending on what kind of effect you're trying to achieve with the flame propagating through space. So we also have exposed oxygen diffusion here. Now oxygen diffusion is important in two cases, so as I'll describe in a moment, 
we have the ability to oxidize soot and the amount of soot oxidation depends on the amount of oxygen that, it, that is available in a particular voxel so you need to turn that on to achieve soot oxidation. Another case where you need soot or oxygen diffusion is when you use a very low burn rate on the source fuel. So here's the burn rate. If the burn rate is close to zero we have the special case of a diffusion flame where we emit fuel only and in order for it to ignite and burn oxygen needs to diffuse into the fuel and that's why in that case you need to turn oxygen diffusion on. So here's an example of the expansion scale parameter in action where it gives rise to the volume expansion in this particular explosion and by adjusting the expansion scale you could adjust the magnitude of this blast so lowering the expansion scale you could make the blast smaller and increasing the expansion scale you could make the blast bigger. So this is a video that demonstrates how the flame propagation speed by default depends on the concentration of species in the voxels but as I mentioned you can override these speeds with the flame speed uh, parameter to achieve either faster or slower flame propagation. So this video illustrates two concepts that I'll be talking about next, namely the soot formation and soot oxidation. And I'll be talking about the parameters that we expose to control this. So the soot it is what gives rise to this glowing look of the flames. And the soot is being formed due to the incomplete combustion process if there's not enough oxygen present. Uh, the soot oxidation, on the other hand, is what gives rise to the non-smoking or, or non-sooty flame. And it's the process where oxygen in the air attacks clusters of soot and turns them into other invisible products. And that's what gives rise to these interesting flame shapes. So let's have a look at the final section of parameters exposed on the combustion settings node. So these are the soot properties. And here we have properties that are related to soot emission and soot oxidation. So obviously soot emission is the emit emission of soot during the combustion, the incomplete combustion process. The oxidation of soot is where the soot is attacked by oxygen in the air and thereby transforming it into other invisible byproducts, essentially eating the, the soot. Now this is the oxidation of soot is what gives rise to a non sooty flame essentially. For the emission of soot, we have two different models exposed, one called simple and one, one called physical. Now the physical is the one that's on by default, but you can turn the simple model on if you wish to use a model that's very similar to what's used elsewhere in graphics, where the emission of soot is just related linearly to the reaction rate. But as I also explained in the Fundamentals of Combustion and Bifrost video, the simple model has some limitations with respect to how physically uh, accurate or plausible it is. In particular, if you have something like clean blue flame near the stoichiometric conditions, the simple model will still produce soot even though in the real world we don't see any soot in that case. So you can switch between these two and the physical a model is based on a model that we adopted, up, adopted from CFD and it's validated for certain types of fuels and it was extended to, to any type of gaseous hydrocarbon fuel by means of uh, some parameters that we use under the hood. Now for both emission or formation of soot and for the oxidation of soot we have a rate exposed Essentially the rate for both the soot formation and the soot oxidation is a multiplier on the amount of uh, soot that's either formed or oxidized in the solver. So you can control the amount that's formed and, and oxidized. Now one, one thing to note about the soot oxidation rate is that in many cases you need to set it quite high and higher than the physical accurate uh, value of 1 
and this is related to the fact that we are taking in graphics typically very large time steps so don't be surprised if you have to set this value to 100 200 uh, in that range now another thing that's important to note about the soot oxidation is that it's coupled to the oxygen diffusion as I mentioned soot oxidation is the process where oxygen in the air attacks the clusters of soot and in order for oxidation of soot to take place there needs to be oxygen present so you need to turn oxygen diffusion on and again because we're taking very large time steps don't be surprised if you have to set this oxygen diffusion value quite high to achieve the effect that you're after so if you need to set it to value of 10 for example don't be surprised now for both the emission and oxidation of soot we have two limits exposed a lower and an upper limit and let's have a look at what they map to in terms of the situation for diffusion flame so here we're looking at a slice through a diffusion flame we have the visible limit of the flame out here in here we have the blue core and the thick black line here is the what is called the stoichiometric contour so within the stoichiometric contour this is where all the reaction is taking place out here we have soot oxidation only so soot formation takes place in a band inside the stoichiometric contour in particular in in this yellow band and it's delimited by two limits an upper limit lower limit and these are the limits that we've exposed in Bifrost and I, that I just showed you so the limits are in fact expressed in terms of the mass fraction of fuel which is for a diffusion flame it would be one in here and zero at the stoichiometric contour so the parameters that I exposed in Bifrost just allows you basically for the lower limit to scale it towards the stoichiometric contour and for the upper limit to scale it towards a value of 1 in here so basically if you use a very large multiplier for the upper limit and a value of 0 for the lower limit it means that you will emit soot everywhere inside the stoichiometric contour so essentially everywhere where we have fuel and where we have a reaction that, that's going on now the soot oxidation on the other hand takes place in this red band out here on the other side of the stoichiometric contour and again it's de delimited by two limits a lower limit and an upper limit so the upper limit is quite similar to the limits that were exposed for soot formation in that it's expressed in terms of the mass fraction of fuel you don't need to know that to use the system but basically what you need to know is that if you multiply the limit or set the limit to a very high value you can force the limit to move into the reaction zone here and essentially oxidize soot everywhere inside the stoichiometric contour as well now the lower limit is actually expressed in terms of a temperature so in the real world there's a lower bound on the temperature at which soot oxidation will take place again you don't need to know that exact temperature but essentially if you wanted to allow soot oxidation to take place everywhere outside the stoichiometric contour independent of the temperature what you'd need to do is just to set the lower limit to zero and then soot oxidation will take place everywhere where the temperature is above zero so that's how the limits control the width of this red band here where the, the bifrost solver performs the soot oxidation and this concludes the overview of the bifrost combustion parameters thanks a lot for listening